You're watching NASA TV. I'm Dan Hewitt with NASA Communications. We have two spacewalks coming up on board the International Space Station, so we're here to talk a little bit more about those today. I have a panel just to my right where they're gonna go over everything that's coming up on board the International Space Station. And once we hear from each of them, we'll go to questions uh, both here in the room for the first time since the pandemic started. So excited to welcome some of our media friends back. Uh, and then also on the phone bridge. And we'll be taking questions via social using the hashtag AskNASA. So first, we're gonna hear from our panel uh, to introduce everybody real quick. Just to my right, we have Joel Montalbano, Program Manager for NASA's International Space Station Program. And then going right down the line next to him, Dina Cantella, the Operations Integration Manager for the International Space Station Program. Just next to her, we have our team for the March 15th spacewalk, starting with Mike Lammers, who's going to be the flight director, and Sandy Moore, who is the lead spacewalk officer. And then just next to them, the uh, lead team for the spacewalk on March 23rd, and that is Paul Kanya, the uh, International Space Station Flight Director, and then Sandy Fletcher, who will be our lead EVA officer. So again, we're gonna hear from each of them first, and then we'll open it up for questions. So I will hand it over to Joel to get us started. Joel. Thank you, Dan, and thank you again for joining us today. You know, on board the International Space Station, the, the seven crew members along with the team on the ground continue to perform all their operations and continue to be a busy time on orbit and both on the ground. Uh, today we'll talk to you about the upcoming EVAs. We also have some other dynamic events that uh, we'll brief today. Uh, before I go too further, I do want to address, you know, what's going on uh, you know, in the world events around us. I can tell you that for over 20 years, the International Space Station Partnership has operated um, successfully in order to do what we do on orbit and on the ground with the International Space Station. We continue with our utilization and research program, our technology development program. We continue with our low Earth orbit commercialization. All these activities have continued for 20 years and nothing has changed in the last three weeks. Uh, the control centers operate successfully, flawlessly, seamlessly. We're not seeing any impacts to what's going on around us. We're able to do our job we're aware of what's going on, but we are able to do our jobs to continue operations. Space Station was designed to be interdependent, such that you know we hit each of the partners have different capabilities that they bring, and together we work. It's not a process where one group can separate from the other. We need everything together in order to be successful, in order to work. You know, for example, on the U.S. segment, we provide non-propulsive attitude control. So attitude control required to make sure we have positive power generation, make sure we're pointing the space station and to the satellites for communication, make sure we're maintaining the, the thermal uh, needs that we need on board the International Space Station. We do that without propellant. We have excess power on the U.S. segment that we transfer over to the Russian segment. We also augment the Russian segment with communication. On the Russian segment, they have the propellant. They, we need the propellant in order to do a reboost. We need the propellant in order to do debris avoidance. Uh, we use the Russian thrusters for attitude control when we have dynamic events or when we, such as a vehicle docking and EVA. We use attitude control if we have a dynamic event. We need to desaturate the gyroscopes on board the International Space Station. So it's a team. We work together, and there's not really a, an operation that you can just separate and go your own way. Uh, because of the interdependency that was designed from the beginning, that's where we are today. You know, looking forward, we do have a number of dynamic events coming up. Uh, you'll hear about this two spacewalks today. We have a Soyuz launch this Friday, and operations continue to go well in Baikonur, and uh, we're communicating with our Russian colleagues on that operation. Uh, we have on March 30th uh, the return of a Soyuz, the return of Anton, Piotr, and Mark. And I can tell you for sure, Mark is coming home on that Soyuz. Uh, we are in communication with our Russian colleagues. There's no fuzz on that. The three crew members are coming home. It's Anton, Piotr, and Mark. And again, we've worked that with no issues. So there's been some discussion about that, but I can tell you we're ready. Our Roscosmos colleagues have confirmed that they're ready to bring the whole crew home, all three of them. 
you know, looking forward, we also have the private astronaut mission, the Axiom 1 mission coming up at the end of March. We have Crew 4 in mid-April, followed by the return of Crew 3. And then looking forward into May, we'll have the Boeing um, uncrewed launch and docking to the International Space Station. So we're looking forward to that. Um, so I just want to finish before I hand over to Dean and say how proud I am of the International Space Station team across the globe. We work together, we've worked together over 20 years and we will continue doing that. And it's just an awesome team to have with us. With that, I'll hand over to Dina. All right, thank you, Joel. So it is a really busy time, as Joel was trying to describe, uh, here in increment 66. Um, we've got seven crew on board, and four of them are NASA, one is European Space Agency, and two are Roscosmos. We've recently had some um, cargo vehicles. We had a, a progress docking, um, but also we've had a, a SpaceX and Northrop Grumman uh, vehicle. And in each case, uh, they've brought up all kinds of resupply and research. And so our crew has been very busy doing a lot of research and science on board. And now we're looking ahead to the two EVAs uh, this week and next week. Um, these will be the third and fourth EVAs in Expedition 66. The first one was in December, it was a US EVA, and the second one was in January, it was a Russian EVA. And so um, the, the EVA that's happening tomorrow is designated US-79. And on this EVA, the crew will, will go out and assemble some brackets at the base of the 3A solar array. And this is in preparation for a later launch and installation of a rollout solar array. On ISS, we have eight channels of, of power um, on the U.S. segment, and we're upgrading six of those with these rollout solar arrays. Um, and so we've installed two fully, and we've installed one bracket, and we're installing now a second bracket. Uh, and over the course of the next um, year or year and a half or so, we will install all of the different arrays. Um, these, the new arrays overlay the legacy arrays, and all told, after we upgrade six of the eight channels, as is our plan, we will have increased the power generation from 160 kilowatts to 215 kilowatts. So on that, on that US EVA 79 tomorrow, uh, the crew will also be uh, un unbuttoning basically a blanket in order to expose some components for future robotics. Uh, and if there's time, they'll be doing a handful of what we call get ahead tasks. Um, just the, um, if possible, before another EVA, we can try to fit something in. Um, and so the, uh, one of the key, I'd say, um, get ahead tasks at the very end of the EVA that we're looking towards is uh, an alpha magnetic spectrometer task. It's just a reach uh, in to uh, see if the crew can access a, an electrical panel underneath that alpha magnetic, spec alpha magnetic spectrometer in case we go back to it in the future. Uh, so we're just checking some feasibility. And then next week on Wednesday, March 23rd, we'll have the second EVA that the flight control team will tell you about. Um, just to highlight a couple of the tasks, so they will be installing two fluid jumpers. Uh, those were found to be leaking in 2017 in our radiator um, ammonia cooling system. And so we brought those jumpers home, refurbished them, and sent them back up for the EVA crew to install. They'll be doing that next week. We're also going to be on the European Space Agency, the ESA, and also the Japanese elements of, of ISS. Uh, for ESA, uh, we'll be on the Bartolomeo platform with an electrical jumper, trying to prepare for some payload installations. And for JAXA, we'll be essentially uh, reinstalling a blanket that's come loose. So, um, you know, I wanted to mention that in between the two EVAs is the Soyuz launch that Joel brought up. Uh, that's happening on Friday and that's um, on March 18th. It'll be bringing three Russian crew members and bring our total complement of crew up to 10. And it'll be 10 until uh, March 30th, when, as Joel said, we'll be bringing home um, the uh, crewmates, Pyotr, Anton, and um, Mark on 65 Soyuz. So they'll undock on the 30th and land in Kazakhstan. Just a few hours later, that will be the launch of the Axiom-1 mission. And this is a private astronaut mission. There'll be uh, four private astronauts on a crewed dragon. And we look forward to welcoming this uh, private astronaut team to ISS. They'll be staying a little over a week. And they'll be doing a lot of science and outreach activities. Um, and, uh, and then you know, the types of things they'll be doing and include all kinds of um, uh, like Earth observation um, and talking to schools. So um, it'll be an exciting uh, eight days or so while they're docked. 
And then in mid-April, um, around no earlier than April 15th, we're looking at the launch of um, Crew 4. And so, uh, you know, this is after Axiom has returned. And then a few days later, we'll bring, bring home Crew 3. So they'll have a direct handover. Uh, in other words, uh, Crew 3 will be able to give Crew 4 um, kind of a uh, you know, tour through ISS and, and make sure everything is uh, well understood where everything is uh, located and that, that kind of thing. And then in May, as Joel mentioned, we'll have the uncrewed vehicle, the Boeing uh, Orbital Flight Test 2. And then in June, we'll have a, a SpaceX um, uncrewed cargo vehicle as well. So it's an incredibly busy spring, uh, and I did want to mention that over the course of just a few weeks, we'll have 18 people that will be living on board ISS and working on board ISS, um, including the crew that's there right now. So um, again, incredibly busy time. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to the flight control team now to talk about the EVAs. All right, hey, uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Mike Lammers. I'm the lead um, flight director for ISS EVA 79, the one that we are um, doing tomorrow. And uh, time of that EVA starting tomorrow will be uh, hatch open at 710 Central. Uh, our crew members are Kayla Barron as uh, EV1 and Raja Chari as EV2. This is Kayla's um, second EVA and Raja's first. Also um, supporting them will be uh, Tom Marshburn. He's uh, what we call the IV crew member in the airlock, helping them prep. And of course, before we even go outside, there's many hours of uh, preparation, getting the airlock ready, getting the crew through a pre-breathe protocol, um, getting ready to take the suits down to, uh, <clears throat> to the environment, the lower pressure environment on, on Pure O2 that they operate at. And Tom really uh, choreographs that whole thing, and they're often the, kind of the unsung hero. In, in running an EVA and getting the crew out the door. Um, additionally, uh, Matthias Maurer is the IV assist crew member, also in the airlock, which is another set of hands. It's really helpful to have um, two astronauts uh, in the airlock helping the two that are gonna go um, outside uh, get prepped. Uh, Mark Vandehei is also um, uh, <clears throat> supporting the EVA as he can, but he's got a number of payloads that he's doing throughout the day. Um, so we'll continue the research on board even as we're doing an EVA. Uh, also, kind of an interesting note is uh, most of the EVAs uh, run by uh, what we call a ground IV, who sits to the right of me in mission control, um, working the crew through the procedures. Uh, that individual tomorrow is um, Victor Glover. We also call Ike, um, who recently came back from the space station and did one of the earlier um, iterations of this bracket install. So he's been uh, a real valuable asset in getting, getting ready. Um, as Dina mentioned, uh, we've, um, th for these so rollout solar arrays, we've done three brackets. We've installed two of the rollout arrays. Uh, this is the fourth set of brackets. It's the first one on the uh, starboard side of the vehicle. The previous were on the port. Of course, we got to um, park the starboard solar array and park the beta gimbal uh, assembly that the crew is going to be working on um, to do that install. It's a, uh, it's a bag of parts, it comes out, it's about 320 pounds. Uh, Kayla's gonna take that all the way down the truss and it's, it's a pretty long distance when you look at it. Um, but they'll get out there and they'll start assembling it. Hopefully uh, have that done um, about two thirds of the way through the EVA and then we'll get into some of the get aheads, such as uh, tying back some of the MLI that um, Dina mentioned. Again, the team, um, we've, even though we've done this particular EVA uh, three times previously in other parts of the vehicle, uh, we incorporated all the lessons learned from those EVAs, um, baked them into our procedures. We've also done a, a couple of simulations with the team. Some of the team members change out. Um, I'm one of them. Um, we do some simulations, and uh, of course, we've run this in the neutral buoyancy laboratory um, up the street to make sure that uh, we don't have any surprises when we do the EVA itself. Um, but again, it's been a real high quality team and, and uh, you know, the, the spacewalk specialists do a, an exceptional um, job. And so with that, one of those people is uh, Sandy Moore to my right, who has uh, done this EVA a few times, but she'll be happy to take you through more of the details. Sure, thank you, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sandy Moore, and I am the lead EVA officer, or spacewalk officer, for tomorrow's EVA. Um, I'll, since Mike talked to you about our crew, I'm going to step you through a bit of what our morning will look like tomorrow. So our crew will begin operations uh, around 1.30 or so Houston time. They'll begin setting up the airlock, and then around 4.30, they'll actually begin their in-suit light exercise pre-breathe. This is where they don the, the suits and begin to breathe pure oxygen 
oxygen in their suits, doing some small exercise to jostle any nitrogen out of their blood. Uh, once that's all complete, um, Tom and Matthias will move Kayla and Raja from uh, the wall and install their simplified aid for crew rescue and put the crew into the airlock for depress. And we do expect to egress around 7.10 um, local Houston time. Um, and this EVA will look very similar to the one back in September, as we will be installing Iversa prep kit, as, as you've heard, on the beta gimbal assembly. Um, we'll close out the day by tying back some multi-layer insulation on some critical spares. And I'll step through some specifics to the upcoming animation. U.S. Spacewalk number 79 will begin at the Quest airlock. U.S. astronaut Kayla Barron, Navy One, denoted by the red stripes, will egress first and receive a very large Irosa mod kit strut bag. U.S. astronaut Raja Chari in the plain white suit will egress second with a crew lock bag. After quick buddy checks, EV-1 will head up to Phase 1 and out to the S-4 integrated equipment assembly, pausing momentarily to drop her fairlead green hook just inboard of the solar alpha rotary joint and then continue her translation out to the S4 3 Alpha integrated equipment assembly where she will stow the large Arosa mod kit strut bag and prep for the building of the upper triangle of the mod kit. Meanwhile, EV2 will follow EV1 up to face one. EV2 will stop at the starboard seat cart where he will temp stow a crew lock bag of tools and retrieve a foot restraint and a worksite interface extender known as a WIFAC and then translate outboard, pausing momentarily to drop his fairly green hook just inboard of the solar alpha rotary joint. Continuing outboard, EV2 will cross over to the radiator side of the IEA and stow the foot restraint and the worksite interface extender into the worksite interface number 26. EV2 will then set up the foot restraint for optimum Arosa mod kit upper triangle installation and then translate over to join EV1 to begin assembling the upper triangle. EV1 and EV2 will work together to build the upper triangle. The crew will build the triangular segment loosely and then will tighten up the structure by driving the bolts to torque. EV2 will then translate over to and ingress the foot restraint. EV1 will reposition for the handoff and EV1 will hand off the upper triangle to EV2. EV2 will lay back and work to soft dock the segment onto the beta gimbal assembly and then drive four bolts. EV1 will temp stow her PGT with a short socket on a local handrail, while EV2 will egress the foot restraint and bias it to the left hand side. EV1 will go over to the bag and retrieve the left mid strut and work to pass this off to EV2 for a body restraint tether stow. EV2 will then re ingress the foot restraint while EV1 retrieves the long eight foot lower strut from the bag and hands it to EV2. While EV2 holds the long lower strut, EV1 will reposition to the solar array blanket box or sob for the install of the left lower strut. As a team, the crew will move the strut into position and EV1 will begin at driving this bolt by hand four turns. EV2 will then work to align and drive his bolt on the mounting bracket side two turns. And then EV1 will work to complete the torque on this bolt by driving with the pistol grip tool to a high torque and then following with an even higher torque on the torque wrench. Once the bolt is deemed good, EV2 will be given a go to drive his bolt to torque using the pistol grip tool. And this completes our minimum config. EV1 will reposition to the beta gimbal assembly and EV2 will hand off the telescoping mid for install. EV1 will work to soft dock the side pad onto the BGA while EV2 holds his clevis bolt side in place. EV1 will start her four bolt two turns with the pistol grip tool and then EV2 will drive his clevis bolt to torque on the mounting bracket. EV1 will then complete her four bolts with her pistol grip tool and then EV2 will drive his bolt to torque. EV2 will then egress and reposition the foot restraint to bias it to the right hand side, the mod kit. The crew will then repeat the handoff sequence. First, the mid strut for body restraint tether stow, foot restraint ingress, followed by handoff of the very long lower right strut. EV1 will then reposition to the right hand side of the 3 alpha beta gimbal assembly, and an analogous install on strategy will unfold. EV1 will position at the right sob bearing for lower strut install and drive the lower strut bolt to torque. EV1 will drive his clevis bolts to the mounting bracket. 
EV1 will then reposition at the BGA and they will hand off the right telescoping mid struts following the same install strategy. Once complete, EV1 will translate onto the mid strut and drive two collar bolts to torque to lock out the telescoping mechanism and rigidize the right hand side. EV2 will then egress the foot restraint and begin to clean up. Once the multi-layer installation, or MLI, is fully closed and wire tied down, EV1 will reposition to repeat the collar bolt and MLI ops on the left hand side. EV2 will then translate around the integrated equipment assembly and stow the tools back in the bag. You'll then fold it in up to third for ready for translation in later in the EVA. EV2 will then translate back around the IEA to the foot restraint and work to stow the foot restraint and the worksite interface extender on his body restraint tether. EV1, in the meanwhile, will translate over to the non-radiator side of the IEA to take some still imagery of the completed mod kit. EV1 will then translate out to S6 to our battery charge discharge unit. She will begin installing some wire ties on a handrail and prep for restraining the MLI or multi-layer insulation that covers the battery charge discharge unit. Meanwhile, EV2 will translate out to the starboard seat of cart to stow the foot restraint and worksite interface extender low profile on the starboard seat of cart. EV2 will then retrieve the crew lock bag onto his body restraint tether and head back out to S6 to join EV1. Both crew will work together to open the multi-layer insulation covering the battery charge discharge units. This will allow for robotic access when needed in the future. They'll perform some on-orbit origami, port it to the shape of a triangle, and restrain it out with a wire tie to a local handrail. The crew will then work to brake torque first on H1 followed by H2 and then restrain the other MLI back to open and expose the second battery charge discharge unit and then work to brake torque and reinstall to a known lower torque on the second battery charge discharge unit. Both crew then will clean up and retrieve the crew lock bag to the BRT or body restraint tether and begin to head inboard for the completion of the EVA. EV2 will lead the way in since he led with second outboard. Translate across the IEA, retrieve his fair lead green hook, translate under the MT, and at the Cedar Handrail Bridge, translate Nader down to our airlock. EV1, in the meanwhile, will translate to the S4 IEA, retrieve the folded up mod kit bag, grab her fair lead green hook, translate past the Cedar carts, hitting those brake pedals down the Cedar Handrail Bridge and to the airlock, concluding a very successful US spacewalk number 79. Next up, we've got Paul Kanya, our flight director for EVA number 80. Paul. Thank you. So EVA uh, 80 is going to look a little bit different than EVA 79 that we just talked about. Uh, we're actually going to have our crew members at separate locations for the majority of the EVA. In fact, it's actually going to seem like there's two EVAs happening at once at the same time. Our first EVA crew member is actually going to be on the robotic arm for the majority or the entirety of the EVA. Our second crew member will be in free float, traversing many locations in the EVA to accomplish many of the tasks that we have scheduled. Uh, Dina did a good job earlier of listing out what those were. Our primary objective is to install jumpers to the radiator beam valve module. Uh, this component controls ammonia flow in our external thermal control system to the radiator beams to dissipate heat that is collected during station with all of the equipment on board. Uh, as she mentioned, we had a leak several years ago. Those jumpers were flown back, they were, they were uh, removed, flown back to earth, refurbished, and are now back on station ready for installation. Uh, we also have the installation of a new high definition camera. Uh, we will be uh, securing the MLI on the Japanese module to protect some cabling that they have uh, on the Nader side of that, as well as uh, doing the power and data connections on some cables for the Columbus modules Bartolomeo platform that was installed uh, not long ago. Uh, our EVA is scheduled on the 23rd, which is next Wednesday. Uh, out the door time, uh, like 79, will be around 7.15 a.m. Uh, our actual crew members on who will be doing the spacewalk will be announced after the completion of tomorrow's EVA. Uh, that will determine also who our 
Ivy, our, our onboard uh, crew members to, to help with suit and getting ready to go out the door, as well as uh, which crew members will be helping uh, maneuver the robotic arm to the positions that we need the crew into to get the task done. Uh, on the ground, we've got Stephanie Wilson, a veteran astronaut who will be our ground IV, talking to the crew through the EVA activities. Uh, Alex Kanalekos will be our Capcom uh, for our normal day-to-day -day conversations with the remainder of the crew. And next to me is Sandy Fletcher, who is our EVA flight controller, and uh, she'll be more than happy now to walk us through our EVA. Sandy? Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before we get into the video, I would like to thank my team. Uh, my EVA task team is Ike Terrio and Mitch Harger. They've been working very hard, as we all have, uh, in order to perfect what is, as uh, Paul mentioned, a very challenging EVA. The video you're about to see has been put together by our virtual reality laboratory here on site, and uh, I hope you enjoy this introduction to our EVA. EV1 with red stripes and EV2 with white stripes egress the crew lock with tool bags. EV2 goes to the forward face of the station, then port to a crew equipment translation aid cart. EV2 stows the tool bag, while EV1 follows the same path. EV1 retrieves a portable foot restraint and installs it in the robotic arm. After EV1 ingresses the foot restraint, the robotic arm operator flies the crew member to the most inboard port radiator beam valve module worksite. Meanwhile, EV2 follows the nadir handrail path and picks up a previously deployed cable reel bag. EV2 deploys the ethernet cable along the handrails, then translates Zenith to the camera port 8 worksite. The end of the cable is pre-positioned at the camera stanchion base for later in the EVA. EV2 retraces the path back to the crew equipment translation aid cart, drops off the now empty real bag, and takes a different bag to the U.S. laboratory module. EV2 takes a cable adapter from the tool bag and translates to the starboard end cone of the European Space Agency's Columbus module. EV2 installs the jumper which passes power and data from Columbus to the Bartolomeo external platform. EV2 goes to the Bartolomeo platform and closes several cable clamps on the Zenith side. This allows future robotic arm operations to install payloads on the platform. EV2 returns to the crew lock bag on the U.S. laboratory module and continues forward in port to the Japanese Space Agency's Kibo module. A section of the thermal blanket has flipped open and EV2 will close the flap and secure it to handrails with a wire tie. EV2 returns to the bag on the U.S. laboratory module. EV-1 installs two ammonia line jumpers, which were removed on an earlier EVA because of a small leak. The jumpers were refurbished, leak checked, and reflown. After mating the jumpers fluid quick disconnects, EV-1 will mate two electrical connectors which will provide heater power. After completing the jumper task, the robotic arm operator flies EV-1 to the camera port 8 worksite. EV-2 meets EV-1 at the camera port worksite 
After retrieving the new wireless access port capable external high definition camera from the crew lock, the two crew members exchange tool bags, after which EV2 takes EV1's tool bag back to the crew equipment translation aid cart and stows it. EV2 retrieves a different tool bag and translates to the port 4 integrated electronics assembly worksite. Several bolts on the 4 alpha side will be released and retorqued at a lower setting. This will make any future robotics replacement operations of those equipment boxes easier to perform. Then EV2 rejoins EV1 at camera port 8. While EV2 was retorquing the four alpha bolts, EV1 replaced the existing external high definition camera with one that provides improved two-way high data rate communications between external payloads and Earth. To ensure the new wireless access port cable does not interfere with the new camera group's ability to pan and tilt, the crew installs a strap to hold the cable in place. EV2 mates the wireless cable to the Ethernet cable routed earlier in the EVA. After the camera changeout is complete, EV1 is flown to the nader side of station to the port radiator grapple bar worksite. EV1 installs two T-handle tools, which will allow the radiator grapple bar to be used in future EVAs. EV1 is then returned to the forward face of the space station egresses the robotic arm and returns the foot restraint to the port cart. While EV1 performs the T-handle tool installation, EV2 translates to a panel on the aft side of the truss. EV2 moves an electrical connector from a non-functional connector to a cable which can provide power. EV2 then picks up tool bags and returns them back to the airlock. After EV2 retrieves another hardware bag from the crew lock, they translate slightly starboard on the forward face and manipulate three electrical connectors. Once that is complete, EV2 routes a power cable along the starboard nader handrail path. EV1 picks up the remaining tool bags and depending on timing, returns to the crew lock or assists EV2 in routing the cable, Zenith, to the pump module. This completes the plan tasks for the radiator beam valve module jumper install EVA. Crew return to the crew lock and ingress. briefers for those intro remarks. Now we're going to get over to questions. I'm going to start with questions here in the room and then we're going to go to our phone bridge. A reminder, if you're on the phone bridge and you have a question, press star one to get added into the queue. If your question's been answered, you can hit star two to withdraw it. And in the interest of time, please limit it to one question so we can try to get to as many as we possibly can. So with that, we'll start off here in the room. We've got Mark Corot. 
Uh, thank you, Mark Caro, for uh, Aviation Week and Space Technology. Uh, I do have one question, and that regards the performance so far of the two IROSAs that were installed. And if you can, when do the next two launch? Uh, the IROSA arrays have been performing without issue, and so we're real happy with the performance. As you know, we had a couple of challenges in the install. We've made those changes for the next set of solar arrays, and, uh, but we don't anticipate any issues with that. Um, in fact, I was out at the plant about a month ago, and uh, the, the new arrays, they look awesome. Uh, the next set of solar arrays are coming up on SpaceX 20... Yeah, in the fall, 26, 26. And so that's uh, right now we're looking at October, I'm just trying to find a date, October of this year, we'll have the next two set of solar rays coming up. And then we'll have two more after that. All right, thank you, Joel. Now we're gonna go over to the phone bridge again, if you're dialed in, star one to get in the queue to ask a question. I'm gonna go down the list and starting with Gina Sinceri and ABC News, Gina. Uh, thank you for addressing the big issue, Joel. The second question I have is this. Have you ever had 18 people up there? Is this all going to be at one time? Where is everyone going to sleep? And so, um, you know, we've had a, a number of folks up on board. Uh, we have sleeping locations for everyone. And uh, so, for example, the Axiom crew, uh, they'll be sleeping. We'll have some folks in the Dragon. We'll have some folks in one of our crew cabins. Uh, we'll also have uh, someone sleeping in the Columbus module. So we have operated with a large number of crew members before. The, the biggest challenge is making sure our ECLIS system, our life support system can support. Uh, but we've had that support. The teams are ready to go, and we're looking forward to having these crew members on board. That the 18 folks on board um, are not all there at the same time. So we'll have seven, then 10, then seven, then 11, um, then I think seven, and, and it kind of goes back and forth. So. Right. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Dina. Uh, next up, we have Kristen Fisher with CNN. Kristen. Hello. Thank you, everyone, for uh, doing this. Now you're very busy, so appreciate it. Uh, Joel, my question is for you. I know you say that nothing has changed in the last three weeks, but is there any contingency planning happening behind the scenes in case relations between the U.S. and Russia do deteriorate to the point where this partnership is no longer possible? Thank you. All right. Thank you. You know, the... Uh the International Space Station, I'll tell you, has been the, the flagship model for international cooperation. And as I talked earlier, you know, the interdependency that we have between the U.S. and the Russian segment, that that is why we are able to operate and how we're operating to do well. At this time, there's no indication from our Russian partners that they want to do anything different. So uh, we are planning to continue operations as, as we are today. All right. Thank you, Joel. Next up, we have Marsha Smith with Space Policy Online. Marsha? Thanks so much. I guess this is for Joel. I'm wondering for the uh, March 30th reentry and landing, how many NASA people have to go over to Kazakhstan for Mark Van de Heij's return? And is there anything different about how they're going to be getting over there and getting back, you know, so that they avoid Ukrainian and Russian airspace and the like? And also, do you know if Dmitry Rogozin is planning to be at the landing? Uh, so let's see. I'll try and remember all your questions here. Uh, I'm not. I'm not familiar with uh, Mr. Rogozin's travel plans. So that's probably best asked, answered by Roscosmos. As far as our operations, we continue the plan to pick up Mark Van de Heij, um, with the NASA plane, like we've always done. Um, the number of people that go over on the plane, it's a total, we have a contingent of just under 20 people that support the landing. That consists of doctors, uh, human research uh, uh, personnel, consists of uh, personnel from the ISS program, from the astronaut office. Of course, you have the, uh, the crew five, or the G5, the Gulfstream five crew. We get some support from embassy and the North Sultan area from the U.S. embassy there. So in total, it's just around 20 people. All right. Thank you, Joel. Our next question comes from Bill Harwood with CBS News. Bill? Yeah. Hey, thank you, guys. Uh, Bill Harwood, CBS News. For Joel or maybe Dean, I'm not sure which, 
Um, you know, we were told before launch that Cygnus is going to do a little reboost test in April. Uh, but just out of my own ignorance, I mean, given where Cygnus and Dragons dock, what sort of reboost is possible in theory from U.S. vehicles? And I understand nobody expects it to happen, but can either vehicle desaturate the gyros, for example, given their locations on the station? So in a purely worst-case scenario, could U.S. vehicles do reboost and desat without the Russians, or is that just not possible? Thanks. The spacecraft is designed um, to do some reboots, but it needs the Russian uh, thrusters for attitude control during that reboot. So while the Cygnus spacecraft will do the reboots, the Russian thrusters on the Progress will be active in helping control attitude. Um, and the thrusters on the Cygnus spacecraft are not powerful enough uh, to go ahead and do uh, attitude control during that reboot. All right, thank you, Joel. Uh, we're going to keep going through the phone bridge. A reminder, though, if you're on social media and you have a question, you can use the hashtag AskNASA. We'll try to get to some of those as well. So next up on the phone bridge, David Curley with the Discovery Channel. David? Thank you. Uh, Joel and team, thank you very much for the details about the two walks that are coming up. But, Joel, uh, can you address in a, in, in a bigger picture, I mean, I had a reader ask, did you hear that they're threatening not to allow the astronaut to come home? Um, just the rhetoric that we hear versus the reality. I'm sorry to put you in that spot. Uh, the reality is Mark Van de Heij is coming home on March 30th uh, with Anton and, and Piotr, uh, period. There's really not much to add on that. We have confirmation from our Russian colleagues. Uh, we hold a readiness review for each of these major events. We had a readiness review with all the participants of the international partners, and everybody confirmed that the three people coming home will be uh, Anton, Piotr, and Mark. All right. Thank you, Joel. Next up, we have Joey Roulette. I think you're freelance right now. Joey? Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Uh, question for Joel. Um, have you or any of your NASA colleagues talked to the White House recently about the crew seat exchange agreement or the you know, ISS 2030 agreement with the Russians? Um, and if so, how did those talks go? And is Ana Kikina still training for a Crew Dragon mission um, I guess, you know, to phrase that another way, is the crew seat swap agreement still kind of active right now? Are you still planning or expecting that to happen? Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Joey. So at this time, we still plan to work the crew swap. And so uh, we still have scheduled training for cosmonauts to come to Houston and Hawthorne and uh, our team to go over to, uh, to Star City and train for the Soyuz. Uh, as far as uh, interactions with the White House, they're aware that we're continuing these operations. Uh, we get questions from time to time, and we answer them. But today, we're continuing to work those agreements. All right, thank you. Next up on the phone bridge, we have Assam Ahmed from AFP. Assam? Hi, right, thanks for doing this. Um, yeah, my the first question is, um, does the U.S. currently have in, uh, capacity to keep the ISS in orbit independently if it has to? I know we're talking about uh, capacities being worked on in the future, but is that a current capacity? And the second question is, given current tensions, uh, is the U.S. government taking any steps to ensure the safe return, not just of Mark van der Heij to Kazakhstan, but to the United States? Thank you. Let's see. Uh, on the second question there, uh, we plan to bring Mark back to the United States on the, the NASA, the Gulfstream 5, like we've done other astronauts, and we're following that same process. Um, the first one, you know, as I discussed earlier, because they are, we're interdependent across the segments, uh, there is no capability. We both need each other to operate the International Space Station. All right. Next up, we have Jeff Faust with Space News. Jeff? Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, question for Joel or for Paul. I'm just curious on the rationale for waiting until after this week's EVA before selecting the crew for the next EVA next week. Um, is it a crew training, crew rest sort of issue, or, or what other factors go into that? Thanks. Sure. It's uh, the, the idea of the astronaut office and who they select for uh, the actual mission will be determined based on the outcome of the spacewalk. Uh, there are a lot of uh, physical implications that could, that could happen based on uh, the crew member's performance. 
and based on the results of the EVA and different activities that have to be uh, uh, worked through or, or issues with suits or anything like that, um, we'll determine who can actually go out the door on the following EVA. So uh, a lot of little variables that, that, that we'll take a look at and uh, uh, our team, along with the astronaut office, will make a determination after tomorrow's EVA on which crew members will be the ones to go out. And yeah, we'll be sure to let everybody know on our social media channels on NASA.gov as soon as we have those names. Thanks, Paul. Okay, our last one on the phone bridge for now, Tom Clark, Sky News UK. Tom? Uh, hi there. Yeah, thanks very much for taking my question. Um, can you give me any sense of what morale is like uh, between astronauts from NASA and ESA and their cosmonaut colleagues up there? They must have um, heard some of that quite dangerous rhetoric um, that we've got down here on Earth. And is there a concern that any impact on morale could affect the safety of the EVAs in this forthcoming busy period that you're describing? You know, the... Uh You've heard this before, but you know when you're in space, there, there's no borders. You don't see, you don't see uh, country lines or state lines. So the teams continue to work together. Are they aware of what's going on on Earth? Absolutely. Uh, but the teams are professional. The astronauts and cosmonauts are some of the most professional groups you'll ever see. They continue to operate well. They continue to operate, you know, above all this work. And uh, there's really no tensions with the team. Uh, this is what they've been trained to do a job and they're up there doing that job. All right, thank you, Joel. Uh, switching over to social media real quick, I do have one for our EVA 80 team. So Paul or Sandy, Raphael wanted to know, the installation of a couple of T-handles on the P1 truss grapple frame. What's the purpose of doing this mod? Why are we putting those handles on? That is a very good question. Uh, they were originally installed for launch. There's a set of four that go onto that uh, grapple bar. Uh, there was some concern prior to launch that they could not handle the launch loads. So those were taken off and flown separately. On the port side, which is the one we'll be working on, two have already been installed and we need the robotic arm to reach the other two. The grapple bars themselves uh, can use the robotic arm to attach to the radiators once they're folded back up and we can move the radiators uh, using the robotic arm. But they do need to have these T-handles in place in order for the grapple bar to uh, be able to affix itself to the structure. All right, thank you, Sandy. And unless I have another one here in the room, nope. All right, I think that's gonna do it for our questions today then. So. Uh, Everybody, thanks for, for dialing in, and thank you for your questions. Thanks again to my briefers for going through these spacewalks. A reminder, the first one's coming up tomorrow on March 15th. Our coverage on NASA TV is going to start at 6.30 a.m. Eastern. Again, that spacewalk starting a little bit after 8 a.m. Eastern. So be sure to tune in. Continue to follow along all the action on NASA TV, on our app, across our social media, and on NASA.gov as we continue to work on board the International Space Station. Station. Thanks everybody from the Johnson Space Center for joining us today and that'll do it. Enjoy the rest of your week.